Good afternoon. It's a rainy Tuesday. Um, it's been raining pretty much all day, as you probably know. Um, and I've got your video lecture for you. I apologize for being a day late. Uh, we had some computer glitches and issues yesterday, so I couldn't get it on time. But um, I will at least you know, get it to you today. Uh, today we're talking about chapter 17, which is all about the Renaissance, the scientific revolution, and religious warfare. And I want to start with the Renaissance. Uh, one of the big parts of the Renaissance is this philosophy called humanism. And humanism is going to become the dominant philosophy beginning around 1400. Uh, there's scholars who rediscover uh, Plato and Aristotle and they begin to debate what those ancient Greek and ancient Roman philosophers meant and what they they uh, were saying and then trying to apply that to the Renaissance. So you have these Italian scholars who are going to invite Eastern Christian scholars to places like Florence and Italy and Rome to uh, translate these works by Plato and works by Aristotle into languages they can understand and they're going to have these Eastern Christian scholars teach them about the classic Greek philosophers. Another thing that's going to happen because of humanism and the Renaissance is there's this rebirth of interest in the worlds of the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. Uh, the Latin text is simplified. Instead of using old Gothic script, they use letters that are similar to what we use today, which meant copying manuscripts and reading manuscripts was much easier. So the constant copying of all of this, these works by the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans led to the development of actually cheaper paper and the idea of movable type printing, which is what we use today. As far as philosophy and political theory go, there's two names you should know. One of them is Erasmus, and in 1516, Erasmus, he publishes an edition of the Greek and Latin New Testament into um, a common language. Uh, and by making the Greek and Latin New Testaments easier to read, uh, it's going to lead to new research into early Christianity and the foundations of the Christian church. Machiavelli, uh, his first name is Niccolo, Niccolo Machiavelli, he's going to write a book called The Prince. And The Prince, it is kind of like a how to rule manual for the city of Florence in Italy. And it's all about this ruthless political competition that you find in European royals. And Machiavelli is going to say, you know, sometimes you have to give the people what you want, and sometimes you have to take from the people what you want. Now, Machiavelli, he's a devout believer in the ideas of Aristotle, these ideas of strength and valor and virtue making up the perfect human. And Machiavelli wanted to encourage the rulers of the city of Florence to embody these ideas, be strong, have valor, have virtue, but then don't be afraid to you know, kill and stab when you need to, to keep on top of things. Renaissance art, when we think of the Renaissance, this is probably what most people think about. Many of the artists of the Renaissance, they wanted personal recognition because they wanted money. Um, it was all about personal accomplishments equaling personal glory. So people like Michelangelo and Donatello and Leonardo, they would make something, they paint something, then let everybody know about it and then they would get paid for it. A great example is Michelangelo and the Pieta. Uh, that is the sculpture that's at the bottom right. Everybody thought that Donatello, or not Donatello, everybody thought that Raphael had sculpted it because there was no maker's mark or anything like that. And Michelangelo got so tired of Raphael taking the credit for it that Michelangelo broke in and he carved his name onto the dress of the Mother Mary. A lot of things in the Renaissance, because they're being paid for by individual people, they lose a lot of their church influence and they 
they are going to represent more real world instances. Um, one way this is going to be done is through anatomically correct and realistic depictions of the subjects. So if a person is sitting for a self-portrait, they're going to be represented with all their warts and everything. And another way this is done is through the use of something called perspective. Uh, the use of perspective is going to turn a 2D image into something that looks 3D. Peter Bruegel, who is the creator of the painting on the bottom left, he is going to depict the burning of a Flemish or a Belgian town by Spanish soldiers. Uh, that is obviously not a picture of Christian imagery. As far as music goes, uh, there are hymns, there are Catholic masses, and there's something called a madrigal that's all set to music. And the main reason that's done is because there were no existing examples of Roman or Greek music around. If there had been examples of ancient Roman and ancient Greek music around, it's very likely the composers of the Renaissance would have used that music instead of Christian and Catholic music. The scientific revolution. Well, we're talking here about some of the greatest scientific minds of, of human history. So early scholars, they're not just interested in philosophy, but they're also learning about mathematics and astronomy. And putting all of these things together is going to lead to this change from a qualitative science to a math-based science. So you have Copernicus, who, based on the discovery of the Americas, he realized that there's scientific proof that the Earth is a single sphere. And as a result of this, he theorized that Earth is just like every other planetary body up in space, that it moves in orbit just like other planets are observed doing. So he comes up with the idea of heliocentrism, which is where the Earth orbits around the sun instead of the other way around. Galileo. Galileo is going to create one of the earliest telescopes. And he's going to base his works on the ideas of Copernicus. He theorizes that the Earth moves around the sun instead of the other way around. And he's going to observe it. He's going to publish papers that formally state no, the Earth is not the center of the universe. Uh, because of that, Galileo is actually condemned by the Catholic Church. He's forced into house arrest, and he has to recant his entire theory. In other words, he has to say, I was wrong. I made everything up. Isaac Newton, along with Leibniz, are going to develop calculus. Uh, they develop calculus independent of each other. Isaac Newton is considered the uh, the true creator of it, even though calculus had existed in um, ancient times as well. But you know, Isaac Newton is the best known name with it. And the whole point of calculus is to use math to prove theories of motion, uh, put these theories of motion into understandable equations that could be solved. Now, later in his career, Newton is going to unite the ideas of physics and astronomy into one field known today as Newtonian physics. And it's done in this book, one of the most important books of all time, known as the Mathematica Principia, Principles of Mathematics. There are some important scientific inventions that come out of the scientific revolution. Uh, for example, there's the barometer that measures atmos atmospheric pressure, telescopes and microscopes to observe and study things that are very far away or very, very small. Then you have the thermometer to tell temperature. There are scientific academies that are developed, like the Royal Society of London and the Paris Academy of Sciences. These are going to be, in many cases, government-funded think tanks where scientists can come together and discuss their findings. We have the creation of tea houses and coffee houses, which I mentioned in a previous lecture, that allow scientists to meet, share ideas, they give guest lectures, and ideas are going to spread rapidly and far in this scientific revolution world. 
There's a new type of philosophy that's based on science that's created by Rene Descartes. And in the world of Rene Descartes, he separates the idea of thought from observable, observable reality. Uh, that's going to be taken even further by guys named Hobbes and Locke, who separate human nature from political reality. And it all is going to come together with Machiavelli from the from a couple slides ago. And Rene Descartes, Hobbes, Locke, Machiavelli, they create what we know today as modern political theory. And Rene Descartes, he is very famous for uh, the saying, I think, therefore I am. Also involved in all of this is the Protestant Reformation. Now, some of you may have talked about the Protestant Reformation in World History One, if you took that, or you may have talked about the Protestant Reformation in high school or something, but I do want to give just a quick refresher. Uh, the Protestant Reformation begins as this movement to reform Christianity. There were lots of things that were going on that people didn't like. Uh, people weren't living up to the morals they should have. Uh, there was infidelity. Uh, Catholic priests were not supposed to live with women or get drunk or have children, and all those things were happening. And then we have something called an indulgence. <clears throat> At the time, in the 14 and 1500s, you could buy an indulgence from the Catholic Church, which absolved you of your sins without actually being forgiven of your sins. One of the people who had a problem with the bad morals, the infidelity, and the selling of indulgences was a man named Martin Luther, who I would say is probably the best known of, the, um, of these Protestant thinkers. Martin Luther, he is a monk from a part of Germany known as Saxony. And in 1517, specifically October 31st, 1517, he posted a set of writings known as the 95 Theses on the door of a cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany. And he's going to argue that indulgences do not save you from being damned. And he's going to argue that indulgences are contrary to biblical scripture. Um, in other words, he's going to say, Mr. Pope, you are completely wrong on your, your understanding of how this works. He's later going to go on to propose this idea that salvation came from faith alone, which was very different from the Catholic world where you had to have faith and good works. And this idea of having salvation by faith alone is one of the foundations of the Lutheran church today. Now, calls for Luther's arrest were given, but he was protected by one of his friends, uh, Frederick III, the Elector of Saxony. And Frederick III, who is this German prince, is going to hide him. And while he's hidden in Frederick III's castle, he's going to be able to develop his beliefs into what is today the Lutheran Church. We also have the Catholic Counter-Reformation also known just as the Catholic Reformation. And during the Catholic Counter-Reformation, um, leaders of the Catholic Church are going to get together and discuss all of the changes that Martin Luther and others have called for and want. And they're going to basically say we're right and everybody else is wrong. But Protestants are wrong. Salvation is based on faith and good works. The Pope does interpret the Bible and the Holy Scripture. Um, and they don't admit fault, but they do make two changes. They create two new orders of nuns, one called the Ursuline nuns and the other one, um, the Carmelite nuns. And then they create an order called the Society of Jesus, better known as the Jesuits. And whenever I teach this class in person, I always refer to the Jesuits kind of like the stormtroopers of the Pope. Whenever the Pope needs somebody to be converted, whether it's voluntarily or not, the Jesuits are the ones who are going to be sent in to do the stormtrooping and the conversion uh, into Christianity, specifically Catholicism. There are quite a few wars on religion that are going to happen. 
One of these wars is the French Civil War from 1572 to 1598. Uh, it's between Catholics and a group of people called Huguenots. They're going to be followers of John Calvin, or you might know them better as Presbyterians. And it starts when King Henry III of a place called Navarre marries the sister of King Henry III of Valois. And that's going to unite France into a modern day country. Margaret's other brother, a guy named Henry of Valois, is going to um, organize this, there's no other way to put it, but this mass assassination. And on August 24th, 1572, because all these Catholics are getting married and they're asserting their power in France, that thousands of Huguenots are going to be killed. And the first day that this happens is known today as St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. This French Civil War does not end until the Edict of Nantes is issued in 1598. And the Edict of Nantes is issued in 1598. It's going to give French Protestants the freedom of religion and the freedom to practice their Protestant religion in what is a Catholic country. Now the Edict of Nantes is going to last all the way from 1598 until 1685. And in 1685, King Louis XIV is going to get rid of it. The Dutch War of Independence happens from 1565 to 1609. Uh, King Philip II, who by the way was a Habsburg that we talked about last time, uh, he attempts to force Catholicism on the Protestant Dutch. And thousands of Dutch are going to be killed. Uh, multiple provinces are going to break away and declare themselves independent of Spain. And this fighting is going to continue off and on all the way up until 1648. The English Civil War, we'll talk more about this in the future as well, but the English Civil War, it devolved from a dispute between the Anglican Church, meaning the Church of England, and the Catholic monarchs of the Stuart family. This is all going to go down about a hundred years after the death of Henry VIII. Um, remember Henry VIII, he created the Church of England and his ancestors don't have the throne for very long. Henry VIII dies and Edward VI becomes king. Edward VI dies before he can have children. So you get Mary I and then eventually Elizabeth I. And Elizabeth I didn't have any kids. So it then went to the next closest relative of, the, of her, which was the, the uh, Catholic kings of Scotland, who were the Stuarts. Now the Stuarts believed very much in something called absolute monarchy. They wanted to have full control. Even though there were rules and laws that had been passed to prevent that. Eventually, the English Parliament deposes or throws out the Stuarts by force after they attempt to run the, king as an, the kingdom as an absolute monarchy instead of the constitutional monarchy it was supposed to be. Uh, king James I is going to be defeated by uh, the guy known as the Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell and his army. Cromwell is then going to take control of Parliament and he is going to run the kingdom as a dictator for the next 10 years. Eventually, Oliver Cromwell does so poorly that when he dies, the people of England want a king back, and the monarchy is restored in 1660 with James II. And that is known as the Restoration. The Thirty Years' War, this is the biggest one. Uh, it's from 1618 to 1648, and it actually involves most of Europe. Now, it begins when, a, when Protestant Bohemia refuses the request of their rulers, the Catholic Habsburgs, to return to Catholicism. And this war happens in a couple of different phases. Uh, typically speaking, the beginning of it is known as the Defenestration of Prague, where representatives of the king, Ferdinand II, are thrown out of a window when they go to talk to the Bohemians. Uh, this starts a revolt. The revolt is put down, 
But the Swedish are going to sweep in at the very last moment and defeat the Habsburgs. Then it moves to the second phase of the war. There are two Habsburg monarchs who unite together. The king of Spain, the king of, of uh, what would be the Holy Roman Emperor or, or Austria, if you will. They join together and they decide to fight Protestants wherever they can. And mainly they're going to fight Bohemia, Denmark, and Sweden. It, they fight to a draw. And then eventually France is going to enter the war on the side of the Protestants. Even though France is mostly Catholic, they side with the Protestants because they see a way to get a political victory and to win political power. All right, we got to talk about absolutism and absolute monarchy for you too. Um, absolute monarchy, you're going to find this a lot in France, but it does exist in some other places such as uh, Prussia with a P um, and uh, Russia with an R. It basically, it meant that the king had tight control over a centralized government. The king controlled everything. The absolute best example of this is King Louis the Sixteenth, who was known as the Sun King. Uh, he became king at the age of four or five, and he was king his entire life, and he died in his eighties. Uh, absolute monarchies, they no longer relied on assemblies or parliament. They made all the choices on their own, and they control everything. They control the nobles. You. Uh, if you are working in the government, the only person you have to answer to is the king. The king had a secret police to make sure that you were doing the right thing and what you were supposed to. Um, in the case of France, many political offices and many government offices, they went to the highest bidder to help the king pay for his lifestyle. And because of this absolute monarchy, France will eventually go broke because the kings of France sell their positions for a one-time fee instead of collecting tax year after year after year. Russia, I mentioned it, uh, it becomes an absolute monarchy after Peter the Great. Uh, Peter is going to reorganize the military, put it directly under his control. Uh, he got rid of all the traditional Russian fashions and Russian dress, and um, he reorganized the entire way that the government collected taxes to benefit him. Then you have Prussia. Uh, Prussia develops into an absolute monarchy after the Thirty Years' War. Uh, the Hohenzollern family, I know that's a mouthful, but the Hohenzollern family, it's going to create a centralized government by taking control of all tax collections. On the other hand, though, we have something called constitutionalism. The best example of constitutionalism is found in England or Great Britain. After the failure of the Restoration, uh, Parliament is going to depose King James II in 1688. So King James II is invited in in, in 1660. By 1688, they've had enough of him, and they kick him out and invite William of Orange, who was the King of the Netherlands, along with his wife Mary, who was Queen to become the new English monarch. Uh, they did this to stop the, the Stuart family from reasserting control of the monarchy. Uh, James I, he lost his head and he lost his throne because he tried to be an absolute monarch. When James II was, was restored into the, the throne, he at first did what he was told to do, but as time went on, he tried to gain more and more and more power. By 1688, it's known as the Glorious Revolution. William of Orange, his wife Mary, throw King James II out, and they agree to follow the rules of Parliament to be given the crowns of England. So Parliament in England is allowed to keep financial control of the economy. Parliament is allowed to keep tax control and tax collection of the economy and a constitutional monarchy succeeds in England and is still more or less the same uh, setup that England has today with Queen Elizabeth II in 2021. 
All right, it's a lot of information. Make sure that you read through the book and make sure you look through this PowerPoint a couple of times. If there's anything that you don't understand, go ahead and send me an email. This is a part of history I actually like quite a bit. So uh, I could go on and on and on and on, but I know if this video is too long, you're not going to listen. So I'm going to stop it here. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Send me an email. Have a great day. Bye.